please give it up for Seth from Pinterest. Awesome. I'm really excited to be here today. So I am Seth at Pinterest, and I'm our product lead for our growth traffic division. That division includes our performance marketing, emails and notifications, and SEO. And if you're interested in talking about how we combine all those things together into an omni-channel strategy, as we talked about earlier today, feel free to talk to me later. Right now, though, I just want to focus on our email and notifications and how we went from a program that was primarily driven by curation to one that's driven by machine learning and automation. Now, why am I up here? Well, I think we all kind of know the printer's brand, but we're sending a few billion emails a month to hundreds of millions of people. And over the last few years, we've been able to increase the effectiveness of our programs by over 300% by applying the principles I'm gonna talk about today. And my hope is that everyone in the room, regardless of your size, can understand the principles that I'm talking about and apply them to your programs. I know not everyone has access to machine learning resources that sit on their notifications team. I have had many a job in the email space, and I know that this is very rare. I appreciate it. But the things that we apply are things that anyone can apply to their programs. And I hope that everyone can walk away from that with that. One of the things I really love that I'm already seeing is how much the same trends are being talked about, how much we're talking about experimentation, iteration, and understanding your customer. So I'll repeat some of the things we heard earlier, and hopefully they just really bring in how important that loop is that the folks from Intuit were just talking about. Before I get in there, I want to talk about what Pinterest is. Pinterest is not a social network. Pinterest is a place where we want you to discover content that makes your life better, whether that's food, Thing, ideas to do with your kids, travel ideas, how to start your first business. We've got people around the world who are discovering and doing what they love from the content they find on Pinterest. Our special sauce is not that we show you what your friends are doing, not that we're showing you what's popular, but that we understand you. All of our systems are built around taking the things you do on Pinterest, the things you look at, the things you save, the things you search, and creating a personal taste profile for you. So that when you come back to Pinterest, we don't just show you food, we show you roasted, roasted Brussels sprouts, if that's what you're interested in. We're not just showing you the stuff your friends are interested in, we're showing you what the people like you are interested in. And that's what makes us special. That's what differentiates us. And so when we started looking at how we wanted to overhaul our email programs in 2015, we said we wanted to create the same experiences. So today, our programs look like this. This is an email. These are all emails I actually have received. So I've got a board called Plating, and this is a very specific niche set of pins just for me. One day, I hope one of these startups hits and that I'm able to retire and be a chef. So I like to collect these images as inspiration of that future life. This email, uh, the, the, the Richard Serra one, is based on a search. So that, I searched for Richard Serra, and we followed up with more content for me. The home decor is actually a broader trending content, but it's not what's globally trending in home decor, but what's trending amongst my interests. So I really like wood stuff and kind of light colors. And then we have a digest that includes a lot of different content. This is where we are today, but this isn't where we started. So we'll talk about the path we took to get there. There are three core principles that we've applied, and that's What's up there? OK, cool. Um, <laughs> I'm going to put the clicker down. It's definitely not working. Um, testing everything. We've already talked about this today. We're going to talk about it more, I imagine, throughout the, throughout the next day and a half. Testing is so crucial to our success. Because even though we had ideas of what we wanted to do, we had to prove them out through experimentation. We also made a bet on centralizing our systems that has paid off huge dividends for us in putting all of our data in one place. The last and most important thing we started doing was understanding how to extend our product value into emails. So our product value is machine learning personalization. And that's why, what, that's why it's successful for, for us to put that in the emails. Not every company needs machine learning automation to back the content of their email. For Pinterest, it's the only thing that makes sense because that is our value as a product, telling you what you can, we can do versus showing you what we can do. So let's jump into experimentation. 
When we think about experimentation, the first thing that we have to do is set the right goals. If you don't set the right goals, you don't know if you're going to have enough of an audience to actually measure your goal. You don't know if you're going to have statistical significance. And so for us, the right goal was to look at weekly active users 28 days after we ran an experiment. 28 days is the window that works for us because that's what our, when our reactivation curves or activation curves stabilize. Not every company is going to have 28 days. Some are going to be 90. Some are going to be a year. For us, it's weekly active users 28 days later. Knowing that was the goal, we built our email systems using the same experimentation platform as the core product. So that means that we're judging what we do in our emails and push notifications in the same way we would any other product change. So we can measure how we changed search behavior, how we changed impression behavior, and particularly, of course, how we changed daily usage and weekly usage. You'll see a few screenshots of this experimentation dashboard throughout the presentation. Just want to talk about it for a quick minute. Blue is good. Blue is statistically significant, positive. Gray is neutral. We don't know about it. And red is negative. So if you see one of these screenshots and you see lots of blue, that's good. When we think about what we want to experiment on, we apply four principles, coverage, conversion, quality, and scalability. Now, scalability is a new one. That's come about just as we've been working on these programs and we understand that we found that not everything we do will actually be able to reach as many people as we want. We can make a great change to our program, but if it only influences 100 people, it doesn't scale for us. So now we need to make those considerations of how many people can we actually affect by these changes. When we work with our new engineers to teach them about coverage, conversion, quality, we show them this funnel. This is the same funnel I've been showing to the engineers on the team since 2015, saying, hey, you want to think about what ideas? You think about this funnel. So coverage, just how many people can I reach with this message? Our conversion rates are going to be each step in the funnel. What's our conversion look like? Open rates, click to open rates, in product engagement rates to views. And then quality is a really important long-term metric for us that we found we can move. Quality, we judge. Uh, really, how, how personal is that content? How much did it get someone to engage with it? So quality is going to be click to open or in product engagement to in product view. Because that tells us we're actually putting something in front of someone that they're interested in. And not just putting in something that they uh, will passively engage with. Now, the other very most important principle we teach our engineers is that most experiments will fail. We range about 45 to a 55% success rate. So that means some quarters, more than half of our experiments don't actually succeed. But it's through that failure that we learn and we iterate and we grow. I want to walk through one specific example of how all these principles come together into a successful outcome for us. So years and years ago, I took all of our emails, and this is before I had all this fancy stuff built, before I had everything integrated, and what I had was open rate and click rates for our emails. That was the data that I had. So I exported it, I put it in a spreadsheet, color coded it using that Excel color code thing you can do, um, and I saw the red ones. And this email, the Pin Twins email, was dark red. And I was like, okay, great, this one's got the lowest subject line, uh, su uh, open rate, subject line performance. So how are we gonna improve it? Pin Twins is an email where we match you with another person who has similar taste. But subject lines, discover new ideas from your Pin Twin. So we ran a bunch of experiments, standard A-B test stuff, nothing fancy, just put a bunch of options in, and we saw that we had a winner. Seth and John, it's a match. So we took the person who you are, so that's me, Seth, and John, the person I got matched with, we put that in the email. We saw a 40% increase in opens. This is a huge, huge success. Not a huge success from the brand side, because turns out Seth and John, it's a match, sounds like a dating site. <laughs> uh, so that's not actually the subject line now. We've had to iterate to get one that still works at the same performance. Um, yeah, we found that out from Twitter. <laughs> so of course, you get a 40% increase in open rate, and you're like, gosh, I want to do that to all my emails. So we took a high volume email, uh, our weekly digest email, and we decided to run some experiments on it. So you can see how old this work is, because that is an email from 2015. I don't know why we center case that salutation, hi Seth there, design choices. 
Um, also, for the record, that get the app link at the top that was in vogue, when we removed it, it did not influence in, uh, uh, downloads at all. There was literally zero change. So the subject line was, hey, Seth, don't miss out on these pins. Pretty vague, not very evocative, not very interesting. And we thought this would be an easy win to improve. So we did like literally 40 subject lines. We put them all in, we tested them all, and we got a winner. That winner, though, was only a 1% improvement. So that was very, very disappointing. We were like totally on board that we were going to do this, and it was going to be great, and we were going to blow out all of our goals, and we were going to have a big team party, and then we saw 1%. But the engineer on the team who was running these, Kuritro, didn't give up. He took the winner. We found some pin keyword and topic display name pins and boards for you. And he started iterating and adding a bunch of different components to it. So he tested high, hey versus high, sum versus new, every type of replacement keyword he could find. And through all of this iteration, again, nothing fancy. He literally just had dozens of subject lines in an A-B test with all these variants. And what he found was he was able to get an 11% 11 increase in opens. That ended up yielding hundreds of thousands of additional weekly active users for us. And so we ended up with a subject line, hey Seth, we found some new roasted, nut, roasted butternut squash and alfalfa sprat pins and boards for you, or whatever the keywords would have been. This is obviously a little bit better of a subject line, it gives you an idea of what the email is, it previews the content for you so I know what it is without having to open, and hopefully we include a keyword that's really personal for you. That win was then the impetus for us to decide, OK, personalization works. Testing at scale works. Now we want to do something fancier than just A-B testing. And we built a copy optimization platform. We're now on v2 of this thing. It's super cool. It can optimize content. Any text string anywhere on Pinterest now, not just notifications. It can do gender, age, locale, user state, all sorts of other cuts to get the right content for the right person. But we would never have built this system had we not gone through those iterative steps. We never would have got the engineering heads to build it. We never would have got the leadership buy-in if we didn't have those results that said subject line personalization is successful. So this is how we approach everything, this iterative test, 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 and understanding what metrics we really want to move. Those gains and losses on weekly active users, by the way. Um, so the next thing we did uh, is really thinking about our systems and how we were able to drive in-product engagement by using uh, one centralized system. We'll talk a little bit about how our tools work. So much like the core product, when people do things in Pinterest, we collect that behavior, whether that's looking at pins or saving pins or doing a search. We also have the behavior that is happening on the content that you have saved, if someone else is saving a copy of your pin, or if there's somebody really similar to you who's saving content. We take all those, and we look at all the different types of content we could send to you, and we decide what we're going to send to you. Do I want to send you a notification that said, Sam saved your pin? Do I want to tell you that there are more roasted but butternut squash pins? We can decide what we want to send to you, and then we decide where we're going to send it. This channel independence has been really valuable for us because we've been able to recycle content. As was talked about earlier with Omnichannel, when you can take the same content and put it in multiple places, it just drives efficiency. So today, we can choose to put that content in an in-app notification, in a mobile browser notification. Desktop notifications have been a huge win for us over the last year and a half, and we're able to just recycle what we already have to get all of that user engagement. And most importantly, we can decide to send an email. And the decoupling of the content from the surface also will, enables us to create really great automated landing experiences so that when I come back in the product, I actually see the content I want. When we started this work in 2015, we'd actually just land you on the home feed. We would say, we have 18 pins for you, and we just put you in the home feed. We wouldn't link you to something that actually had those pins. We wouldn't follow through on the promise. But by centralizing and building these tools, we were able to do that. Then your behavior is going to feed back in, where we decide when we're, when we're going to send you a notification in the future, which channels we're going to send it to you, did you respond to the push, did you respond to the email, in the future, did you respond to the SMS. And all of that feeds back into what we decide to send to you in the future and on which channels we decide to send it to you and when. Now, this is the system that my team owns. This is the, our growth notification system. This thing sends about 90% of our overall email and notification volume. 
our systems also have other inputs where other teams are creating emails. And one of the choices that we made, though, was to centralize all of the data and a final decider on what people would get so that we could make sure we weren't overloading consumers with too many messages from different teams. We wanted to make sure that the notifications experience was not reflective of our org structure. And so putting everything to feed through this one final system where all the data is collected in one place, I can understand user behavior holistically with one database has been incredibly powerful for us. One of the things that we can do with this is also potentially plug in external email service providers so that as we continue to grow and as we need more tools, we're still able to empower our, across our org people to do their jobs, but ultimately all of our data is feeding back to one place. I talked a little bit about these emails earlier. I want to talk about how they're made and how we choose what to send. So we have all this content, pins, boards, pinners, topics, searches, uh, and a bunch of different ways I can recommend it to you. And we take the cross product of all of those. So I can send you personal uh, board recommendations, popular searches, or trending pins. And we built a bunch of different notification types that people can be eligible for, and we put them in a list, and we stack rank them. And the way our original tools worked when we started building this stuff in 2016 was that we would go through every single person and try and send them one of these recommendation notifications a day. We uh, would literally just go down the list and say, are you eligible for email A? No. Are you eligible for email B? No. And then if it would send it to you, it would say, OK, don't send that same notification again for a week. The reason we wanted to try and send one per day was because we'd done research in 2015 that said the optimal number of emails for people to get is four to seven a week. Now, four to seven a week was on average the optimal number, but as you would imagine, not everyone experiences the same thing. And some people, that's too much, and some people, that's too little. So instead of sending everyone the same amount, we then had the genius idea of let's segment our list. Let's take the people who don't respond and not send them email. And what we saw was that if we took people who had really low probabilities of clicking on an email, and where probability here is literally your past email click-through rate, and we didn't send you emails, we could get really good results. We were able to filter 34% of emails while losing less than 1% of clicks and ultimately increasing our overall CTR by 50%. This has helped us maintain really uh, great email deliverability uh, as we've scaled. And you can see here there's lots of gray, which means we didn't impact users. And I'm a growth guy, so I was, of course, like, well, let's send those people who like it more. Uh, and we did. And we sent 5% uh, uh, more emails to those people who had very high past click-through rates, huge gain in clicks. But you see here this behavior where it goes blue and then gray and then blue and then it kind of goes off. It continues to do that because the only reason we're increasing behavior is that we sent an email. We're not actually changing long-term retention with this experiment. We wanted to go deeper, though, because if we could get less engaged people, because the people who click our emails the most are also most engaged with our product. If we get less engaged people coming back, we could make it sustainable. So the next iteration of this experiment was to say, let's use different thresholds based on how much you use Pinterest. Are you really hyper-engaged? Are you mildly engaged? Are you unengaged? And send the highest uh, clicker, the people with the highest click-through rate in each of those categories more emails. When we did that, we increased email volume 20%, and we were able to get an overall increase of more than 70% in clicks from those audiences. And you see the blue here is blue everywhere. So this was fully sustainable. From there, that said, OK, if we can get a little more personal with the type of uh, email frequency that we're sending to you, we get better results. What if we fully personalize it, which is what we did? Today, we have a fully machine learning backed personalized frequency tool which decides how many emails are sent to you this week so that you use Pinterest 28 days in the future. That's the goal of the machine learning model. It's really, really powerful for us to have been able to do this because we can customize for each and every person what they're receiving. If you want to know more about machine learning and what those goals means and all of that, uh, Emily from Credit Karma is going to talk more about how to use that technology. Ultimately, I can tell you, as a marketer, it was very scary at first, but you learn the lingo and you work with the professionals and they take care of it because I don't know how machine learning works. <laughs> OK, last principle, extending the product. I'm going to talk about this in three steps, onboarding and education, content personaliz personalization, and interactive emails. 
Years ago, we had an email program where we sent you one email a day, every day. And that was our onboarding program. Everyone got the same emails. The only thing we did was translate the language for your personal language. But the same content went out across the world. So everyone got the barbecue search wherever you are in the world. Everyone got watermelon in the kind of inspirational email, regardless of if watermelon even existed in your country. And we spent an inordinate amount of time optimizing this thing. This was our bread and butter for activation. We each and every single email had engineers working on it, optimizing it, doing subject line tests, doing triggering tests, working on the order. But what we saw was that after the eighth day, when we started sending you more content recommendation emails, primarily human-driven content recommendation emails, that we had, they had higher open rates, higher engagement rates. So my team wanted to look at those. And we wanted to figure out, how do we continue to make these better? So this is what the editorial emails look like. We had a team of about 40 people working across the globe in six offices building these emails. And they'd have pithy, cute subject lines, uh, like, it's getting chilly outside, scarf it up, um, things like that. <laughs> but they weren't personalized. These are emails, again, I received because these are the emails we sent to every man in the United States who was a Pinterest user. But you know what? I'm not a caveman. Some people love this content. I hate it. This isn't me. I'm not interested in this and it gives me a bad perception of the brand. The biggest problem, though, wasn't the content mismatch. It was that as we scaled, there were all these countries where we weren't creating editorial emails. So after day eight, we would basically start not sending you emails. We might send you an activity email, and that was it. So we looked and we talked to the team and we said, hey, are you going to hire more marketers? And they didn't have the budget, so on and so forth. We said, well, what if we take uh, this endpoint that was out there where we had categorized popular pins and we run this as an email experiment in the markets where we don't have editorial? And what we saw when we ran these was, of course, a huge increase in engagement because we went from sending no emails to sending emails. That's, of course, cheap and easy. Uh, more importantly was we saw higher open rates, clicked open rates, and in-product engagement rates than with editorial. The next step, of course, was then we went to the marketing team and said, hey, we want to test this head-to-head -head in the States against the editorial emails and see how they perform. And again, we saw that these performed better at each step of the funnel. It wasn't dramatic, but they did better. The thing about moving to automated content generation is that it becomes iterable, yeah, it becomes an iterable platform, something you can build upon, something you can make better, something we can personalize more. So this is, that's exactly what we did, is then we, we built a niche recommended pins. So instead of it just being broad categories like home decor, it's now my specific interest in woodworking. Instead of food and drink, it's roasted Brussels sprouts, so on and so forth. This was the game changer for us, this dramatically outperformed any other email that we had in every way, shape, and form, including having a lower unsubscribe rate. Because it turns out when you show that we understand who you are and your interests, you engage more with our emails and our product. This, of course, led me to go back to the editorial team and say, hey, I'd like to stop sending your emails and doing any of that and only send this, which they loved. But we, you know, they're my, they're my coworkers, so I, and I myself am a marketer. I'm not trying to like, get anyone's job disappeared, but uh, I am trying to put the best product out there for our users. So the marketing team had a hypothesis that said, hey, I think if people just knew it was editorially curated, they'd respond to it, they'd love it. And we tried all of these different form factors and presentations of editorialized content to see if that resonated with people. We tried many more than these as well. We tried subject line experiments. We tried saying it was from Jen, because she was one of the marketers who actually built the email. And what we saw is that none of them could perform nearly as well as these niche recommended pins, because that's our brand value. Our brand value is not as a site of editorial curation. Our brand value is a site that understands you and is a personalized taste engine. And by bringing those into the notifications, that's where success lied. So no one lost their job, but we did get rid of editorial email. And today, we're totally reliant, in, in a good way, on all of this machine learning and automation to drive our content. That does come with road bumps, though. 
Uh, I'm not sure, as a parent, I kind of understand why frozen punch liquor drinks are there with babies, but uh, <laughs> not exactly what we want. Uh, we also had teams like make backend changes uh, so that where we got the titles was serving access denied for us. This is text in an email, so it was permanently baked in there, of course, after we sent it. Uh, we also had filtering issues, uh, content like guns making it through, uh, because we did look at what people like you uh, potentially like. Guns is not content we want to send. We also had really heartbreaking examples where we did not think through what happens when you let the machines loose. And if I have one recommendation for anyone who is looking at moving towards automation, it's think through the worst case scenarios and use these as examples. Because this is a real email we sent. Somebody used Pinterest in an incredibly difficult time in their life, and we sent them this. And it gets worse. On 9-11, we sent out a trending search email of 9-11 jumpers. Graphic imagery in it. We sent about 300,000 of them before the first tweet came in, and I immediately was like, turn off all systems, stop sending all email. What happened? And this was a real inflection point for us. So this was 9-11 uh, of 2016. And we had Q&A with the CEO that Friday. The first question in Q&A was, I saw this news article in my Google Alerts. What's happening? Should we not do this? Should we use editorial content? And our CEO was on, on stage said no, that this was an opportunity for us to get better, not to run away. Because what he had seen is that by providing personalized and automated content, that put our brand into the inbox and that people liked that content. And that what we needed to do was make sure we had the right filters in place to prevent something like this from ever happening, not completely shutting down our program. Now, if the CEO had had the other opinion, I probably would be telling a different story on the stage right now. But luckily, that was his perspective, and that's exactly what we did, was put a lot of effort into our content filtering. But it was after the fact, um, so think about it ahead of time. Now, that new user email flow, as I mentioned, uh, we went back to that. And what we saw was that for emails like that day three email, which we sent to someone who created a board but hadn't saved any pins, it worked phenomenally well as an email. 50% click-through rate, half of those people would save their first pin. If you look at an email, you're like, gosh, that is just an amazing performing email. But when we did a holdout, we found that it did not matter whether you had saved your first pin from the email, clicked on it, opened it, or even ever received it, it had no impact on your retention 28 days later. So we scrapped this series of emails. And instead, we put that content first. We showed you the value of Pinterest rather than trying to send you an email that, to that told you about the value of Pinterest. And we put our brand first. Just to be clear, lots of people need onboarding series and they can be great. I'm not you know, saying all onboarding series are bad. The last thing I want to share is how we're thinking about interactivity, because that's the last extension of our product, is saying, how do we start bringing in the UI? So last year, we started working on this uh, CSS-based animation where we put a gray highlight when you mouse over a pin, and it's got a save button that shows up. This is what happens in the product instead of just being a flat picture. You might not be able to see the gray outline on the projector. It's often washed out, but you got the little save button there. And what we saw is that interactivity worked for us. It was a roughly 1% increase in clicks. The problem is that the increase in CSS and HTML size for us to enable interactivity meant we couldn't include as many pins in the emails due to Gmail clipping. And when we tested having interactivity with 12 pins in the email versus having 18 pins in the email, the 18 pins is what worked better. So again, it's getting the content out there rather than the presentation or the flashiness of the interactivity. I, of course, want to figure out how to bring those fancy things in the inbox. So when uh, Google came to talk to us about AMP, I was excited to get in there. And so we are looking at how we utilize AMP for HTML uh, as Gmail looks to roll out support for that in Q1. And we're gonna talk more about it at tomorrow's panel, but you can see this is a sample of a real email. This would work in the inbox, does work in the inbox, rather. And instead of going to the, the, our product, you're able to click on a pin, go into the close-up right there in the inbox. You can see the ingredients, you can navigate through the email, you can save. Uh, right there in the inbox, so I can go back to my feed. Again, this is an actual email that works in Gmail if you have an AMP-enabled account. 
And you can, again, save right there in the inbox. So it saves so many steps for the consumer. Instead of them having to come back to our product, right then and there, they can get the more information that they want, and they've got everything they need. This is how we're thinking about AMP. I don't know if consumers are going to like it. I'm just willing to test it. I'm willing to find out with, about what the inbox is going to be in 2019. I'm willing to get on board with that experimentation. Because we might fail, but we'll learn from it. My last note is just that while I like all this presentation stuff, ultimately personalization is the lever we're going to rely upon. We launched a new algorithm that does seasonal recommendations for people. It was a huge win. Millions of additional weekly active users came from that. Because again, it was about understanding you and the type of content that you might be interested in and getting that to you on a timely basis. So I've got my three principles. Test everything, centralize where you can so you understand the impact, and extend the product. And whatever your product value is, if you are an editorial curation site, you should have editorial content in your newsletters. I'm not saying editorial is bad. I'm saying know your brand, know your product, bring that in the inbox. With that, if anyone wants to reach out, I'm Seth at Pinterest.com, at Seth Weisfeld on Twitter. I'll be around. I'll be at the uh, Ask an Expert questionnaire thing tomorrow. Thank you very much.